Hi everyone, my name is Deepak Iyer, and I'm currently serving as the chair of the Biodesign and Innovation Committee within the SIR Medical Student Council. It's my great pleasure to moderate this year's highly anticipated annual IRDR resident match panel. We're joined today by a panel of some exceptionally recently matched um, MS4s and now incoming PGY1 IRDR residents who have graciously volunteered their time to give their thoughts and advice on a wide variety of topics related to how to succeed as an IRDR applicant. And so if you have any questions throughout today's um, talk, feel free to just um, put it in the questions um, box within GoToWebinar and I'll try and moderate um, throughout the panel. Um, and I'll also give some time towards the end um, so that we can answer some of your questions. So throughout the webinar, we'll talk about um, just choosing how our applicants chose IR, um, how they went about med school, um, some advice that they have, and then we'll jump into the application process and finally um, get some final questions from the audience at the end. And so now we'll have our panelists introduce themselves. Adlai, you can start. Hey, hey everyone, my name is Adlai. Oh, Adelaide, it's all good if you're French. And I'm from Miami. I spent some time up in Boston for undergrad. I did, I was at MIT and then I did some cancer research for a while and some other things, <laughs> bartending, dancing, it was fun. And then eventually I went, I got into medical school at Howard and that, now I am um, going to IR at University of Washington. Although right now I am about to start my intern year. We just had orientation beginning today. Oh, it's exciting. Um, any other things or just introductions? Yeah, that's great. Um, Rayan, if you want to okay. give an introduction. Hey, everyone. I'm Ryan Abood. I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio. I uh, did my undergrad at Kenyon, did my master's in anatomy at Case, uh, and then did a year of actually uh, research after that. And got really lucky, got into Wake Forest uh, med school, and I just started my TY year at University Hospitals the medical center. Thanks for having us. Great, and Amy, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, so I'm Amy. I am from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, went to undergrad at UW-Milwaukee, uh, at the state of Milwaukee at the Medical College of Wisconsin, um, and just had orientation today as well. Thankfully, ours was like three hours for now because a lot of training was online. Um, so I'm going to be doing a surgery prelim year at the University of Virginia, and then three years of DR and two of IR. Great. And then um, Min is currently um, on her vascular surgery service. Um, so, you know, if time permits, she'll um, hopefully be able to jump in. But um, just as a quick introduction for her, um, she went to medical school at Boston University and is going to be an incoming IRDR resident at Brigham and Women's up in Boston. And finally, Tony. Hey, everyone. My name is Tony. Um, originally from Northern Virginia, just right outside of DC. Uh, went to Virginia Tech for undergrad and went to VCOM, um, which is a DO school in Blacksburg, Virginia, for med school. Uh, couples matched at MUSC with, uh, she did PEDS, um, and I'm going there for IR. I actually just started my surgery prelim uh, orientation today. So uh, if you have any questions about applying as a DO or applying couples match, then I'm, I'm your guy. Awesome, great. Um, thank you guys again so much for taking your time. I know it's been really hectic with, um, you know, moving up to your respective programs and starting orientation. So we really appreciate you taking the time um, to talk with us all today. All right, so first we'll get into how you guys chose IR. Um, so, you know, things along how you first learned about IR um, and some things you did um, early on in medical school to, or later in medical school to make sure that this is the right, you know, career for you. Um, and yeah, we'll start off with Ryan. Hey everyone. So I've hosted one of these panels and I know there's a lot to get through, so I'll be kind of quick with my answers. Um, so I found IR through my cousin who was a DR resident at the time and then through my urology research uh, where I observed an MRI-guided prostate biopsy. It was performed by an IR. 
Um, when I got into med school, I was intentional about every project I took on and chose to focus uh, on IR before moving on to other specialties to focus on. Uh, fortunately, I fell in love with it, and I fell in love with the philosophy and the versatility and the variability that the specialty offers. Um, so personally, I would start with shadowing, then try to get involved with uh, VIRID projects, so uh, the VIR interest groups at your school, or IR research projects if you have them at your school. Um, in my experience, there's no better way to showcase your value to senior medical students, residents, attendings, than to help them take that project from start to finish. And uh, you'll be amazed at the mentors and friendships you form throughout that process. Great. Thank you, Ryan. And Tony, if you want to jump in. Yeah, so I was, uh, I knew about IR from one of my close friends who had matched a couple years before I had even started med school, or I was like kind of start, first starting on med school, but I didn't decide to really look into it until my third year. So I was actually late on the ball. And um, I did a rotation. There was like an elective available at my school. And I really liked like the different tech that was being used and the uh, like the idea of having like low complications, minimally invasive, working on virtually any part of the body. Uh, it's really fascinated me. So I uh, did more IR rotations and I also did DR rotations just to make sure, you know, I, I really liked DR as well because that really is the foundation of IR and you would absolutely hate IR residency if you did not enjoy DR as well because that's like pretty much half the job. Um, so just rotations and talking to people is really the way to do it. And uh, for people like me without resources at, at my medical school, the SIR is the way to go. Join the Medical Student Council, join the Medical Student Reserves, you'll find projects. Um, and you can also, you know, talk to faculty and students from across the country. And that kind of reinforced what I loved about IR and the IR community, you know, just meeting different people through the SIR and everyone's so willing to help and teach. And it was something that I hadn't found in other specialties. Great. Thank you, Tony. Um, and in the interest of time, um, until Min is able to join us, um, if she's able to get off her service early today, um, then we'll just continue on. And hopefully she'll be able to jump on a little bit later. Okay, great. So now we'll talk about the preclinical years. And, you know, recently we've switched um, to a pass-fail step one. Um, so um, hopefully you guys can get some insight on how to best make the most of the preclinical years um, in this new era of pass-fail step. Um, and Amy, if you'd like to start. Yeah, so given that step is pass-fail now, um, frankly, I entered the field, I guess, already, with um, a relatively low step one score compared to a lot of my peers. I was about 20 points below the average. And um, so granted that's not pass fail, but I think that a lot of the things that I did in the preclinical years kind of helped set me up for success despite having a step score that wasn't quite exactly where I wanted it to be. Um, so that included research, um, worked on a research project for about three years with IR. Um, and through that, I also became part of SIR, um, worked on the education committee um, and the vice chair of pediatric education, which if any of you guys are watching, I promise we're making progress behind the scenes. Um, so really just trying to get yourself out there, shadow if you can. Um, Preclinical, you have a little bit more time compared to when you're actually in your M3 and M4 years. Um, and if you're able to join SIR and any of the committees that interest you, I cannot speak highly enough of this institution. Great. Thank you, Amy. Um, thanks for sharing your experience. Ad Adelaide, if you'd like to go next. Yes, of course. Hey, I don't know if my video is, everyone's frozen for me, but um, I'll just keep going. I, I don't even see myself. But I would say, so for the preclinical years, I would just dive into the preclinical years. Um, I, I would take time to just uh, feel like I would a part of each of the disciplines like okay maybe i'll go into cardiology let me really focus on this heart section and uh, and uh, and try to embrace the the uh, the material from that standpoint and then i would also take some time during those preclinical years to go into the clinic or onto the hospital side 
as as Amy was saying before, we do have more time, uh, uh, more time uh, to use on your on your own, and uh, just to get familiar with with what it's like to be in the clinic. And I think some of those things, or I feel like a lot of those uh, initiatives drove me to like strengthen certain skills and like it drives you to study when you need to. And I was even, I was doing extracurriculars during the time and it, it forced me to study uh, uh, material uh, in order to prepare for the exam that would be coming up. Um, I, would, I also had experience with these. And I think that also encourages motivation during these preclinical years. So I, I, I support uh, just diving in, doing some research and taking some time to go into the clinic. Oh, and go to the symposia during these preclinical years that may be popping up around in your areas, like the SIR symposiums, or if your school uh, RIG or IRIG puts on such events, uh, go into those. Oh, I can say. Great. Yeah, thanks, Adelaide. Um, yeah, I think diving into you know the preclinical curriculum and really you know setting yourself up to have a good foundation is really important. Um, and yeah, definitely second year um, comment about um, going to the symposia, which is actually where we met. So um, yeah, great. Now, Ryan, would you like to um, you know talk about your preclinical experience? Yeah, I, I'd echo a lot of what Amy and Adelaide just said. Um, really focus on what you're learning in class because. That's going to be your foundation, as they both said. Um, and now, since uh, step is pass fail, honestly, that does buy you, I'd say, more time because people really get after it for step one, especially. So I, I would focus um, a little bit of that extra time you have on cultivating a strong framework to do research, to join interest groups, to go to symposia, to apply to the MSC, to really just add value somewhere. It doesn't have to be IR, it could be any specialty you want to get involved in, but just like kind of you know, showcase yourself in some type of way. You each have something like valuable to offer. It can be in anything, it doesn't have to be medicine. But just, it's a good time to do that because that initial foundation you set up, you're gonna be building on it for those next few years. Um, in, in my uh, honest opinion, the hardest part is really starting each of those projects and setting up that foundation. So if you do a first year, it kind of just like falls into place for those subsequent years. Um, and um, yeah. Uh, at, at later points, uh, you just don't, you don't have to actively seek out those projects when you're like busier in your clinical third year and you have step two looming and applications, blah, blah, blah. Uh, really, the work will just happen. And that was the case for me in the MSC when I joined uh, early on, like Amy, we kind of, the hard part was getting in, honestly, and getting used to that workflow. But then when we're in, it's kind of just, it's just churning the wheels. You're just kind of, you know, plug and play. And that's, that's what I would say. Great, thank you, Ryan. That's all great advice. Um, so next we'll move on to um, the clinical years. So um, just some general advice you have for the clinical years. Um, what core rotations do you think are especially important um, and what you should take away from those rotations? What electives other than obviously diagnostic radiology and interventional radiology um, do you recommend doing? Um, and finally, if you have any advice um, regarding step two scheduling, um, I know some people you know, are concerned about whether they should take it before they apply, after they apply. Um, so any insight you have on that would be much appreciated. Um, and we'll start with Tony. So uh, clinical years in IR really, and you know, I, I, this was something I was always uh, worried about before going on like, you know, audition rotations or whatever, but really just come with a willingness to, to learn and you just like you want to ask good questions like be interested um and you'll you'll take away a lot from that i actually when i i was uh listening to this panel last year and someone recommended this book called the handbook of clinical ir see if i have it in my backpack i read like the first couple of chapters of it it gives you like a very good like base foundation understanding this book right here super easy read um i would definitely recommend taking that on your rotations with you you can read up on some procedures as well what i would try to do is if there's gonna be like a really big interesting procedure i would try to read up on it the night before just in case the attending would ask me questions about it typically never really happened but i could ask better questions about the procedure because i knew i had some kind of base knowledge and that's like the hardest thing with ir it's like it's hard to get the base knowledge because it's so different from everything else 
Um, the only similar rotation I did, which also helped me uh, in terms of IR was interventional cardiology. If you're able to do that rotation, I highly recommend that. And obviously diagnostic radiology. So just like get used to the, the reading and also get used to, you know, how interventional cardiology like sees patients in the clinic. If uh, IR at your institution is not very clinically oriented, um, you know, a lot of the residency programs are moving in that direction and they want to model after interventional cardiology. So that's also like a really good rotation to do and get a letter from if you can, in my opinion. And uh, people say um, vascular surgery is a good one too. I never did vascular surgery. A lot of people like to get letters from vascular surgery, a lot of endovascular in the angio suite, that, things like that, and managing a lot of PAD patients. And that's like, a, I think that's like the big thing you want to take from vascular surgery, just managing those patients. Um, but those are the main electives, I would say. In, in terms of step two, just, you know, especially for the people who have pass fail step one, um, just take as much time as you need where you feel like you can confidently do well. If you say you want to improve from your step one, or that's going to be the only thing they're going to use to stratify you for the, the younger folks. Um, just uh, step two scheduling, you know, the way I approached rotations was before I went on my sub eyes, I just did like a practice rotation, like at my, um, like a practice DR rotation like in July of my fourth year before things really ramped up. And I was like, you know, it's very low stress, half days. That's a good time to take step two. And I, that's what I personally did just to kind of warm myself up, get myself back into like the radiology rhythm before my IR sub eyes. Great, thank you for sharing, Tony. Um, that's all really good advice about how to maximize, um, you know, your clinical years. Uh, Adelaide, would you like to go oh, next? Nice. Yes, and thank you for that. Uh, those were good points, Tony. So general advice for the clinical years, I would say again, um, diving into each of the each of the disciplines, I would also think about. So at, at the end of each of our rotations, we would have presentations, or maybe throughout the rotation, depends. We would get presentations, and I would suggest uh, maybe designing your presentation around something that IR does that it's in that field like during my surgery rotation I would do a presentation on IVC filters during my OBGYN presentation uh, I mean my rotation I would do one on UFE so they so at the same time I'm learning about it and then the residents are like oh that's cool I should look into that a little more and I think that then they can probably tell their attendings about it and if you are feeling really good about that rotation, you might even be able to get a letter. Uh, well, anyway, that's down the road. And so which core rotations are especially important and what should aspiring IRs take away from these cores? I felt that uh, the medicine rotation, I mean, just that was my first rotation, just getting into the whole idea of taking care of patients is really important just to get a foundation. And if you have time in the clinic, um, really uh, try to, feel like you're a doctor uh, and take ownership of your patient. It's gonna be hard in the beginning, but as you do it more and more, you'll get more comfortable, or I got more comfortable uh, doing that. And since IR is going into more of the clinical realm, I think it'd be good practice during those core rotations, during medicine and surgery, especially, because you get the idea of the procedural um, aspects of IR. And, uh, what other rotations? If you have a chance to do ICU, it, I felt like it was helpful. Um, just getting me that shift. So firstly, it's just like the idea of going in for a certain number of hours and then taking care of really sick patients is really helpful. Uh, sometimes you get to help with putting in IVC filters or biliary drains or G-tubes. And I felt like that just doing that rotation was really helpful for me to see how involved IR is in taking care of such patients. Um, and vascular surgery, really important too. If you have that opportunity, go for it. And when, okay, so with the DR and IR, I, I did the same thing. I did a home rotation for diagnostic radiology and that just gave me some time to study for step two, <laughs> as well as uh, learn a little bit of the basics of radiology before heading into uh, an, an away rotation. And no, no, just for building my foundation in different radiology um, techniques. Uh, 
yeah, so for step two, I'm just saying what I did. I took it a little early. It was my first fourth year rotation in August, and um, uh, so it's out of the way, and I don't have to worry about it later on. But I know other people take some time to do it later because their step one score is, you know, amazing, fabulous, or something. You don't want to tarnish it with anything. You won't tarnish it. You're amazing. Everyone's awesome. But I had a rather, I mean, my step one score wasn't what I wanted it to be, and I wanted to make sure I got my step two in, and and thankfully there was some improvement, or there was great improvement, and they saw that. So if you, I, I think it's dependent on your step one, but since it's pass fail, it probably isn't that big a deal anymore. Okay. Great, that was really good advice, Adelaide. Thank you. Um, I especially liked how you mentioned how you would, um, you know, teach your residents on your different rotations. Um, I think we're never mm -hmm. too early in our, um, you know, training pathway to educate some of our other colleagues in medicine about IR. So I love that point. Yeah. All right. So next, um, we'll move into research. Um, so if you were involved in research, um, if you thought that was helpful for your application, um, if residency programs expect research um, based on your experience, um, and any advice you have for identifying and choosing research mentors. And if you think it's important for students to attend and present at conferences. Um, and Ryan, we'll start with you. Uh, yeah, so um, if I feel that uh, research was helpful for the application, I do think it's helpful. It's similar to other extracurriculars, but I think it's kind of unique uh, in that it's research and it can be an IR. So uh, the reasons I like to do it was it was great for networking. You can make a name for yourself and make great mentors. Uh, it's good for understanding the specialty at a deeper level. So um, I did research on like ports, which are like bread and butter, nothing too sophisticated, right? But uh, you really get into like the, the weeds um, and like in, uh, you really stick your feet in the dirt <laughs> um, when, when you're doing research and you learn a lot about it and you can have a lot of conversations about it in your interviews. Um, three, showing a commitment to the specialty. So that's something that's uh, been noted to be important to PDs that uh, if you can demonstrate uh, that you're committed to the specialty of IR in some type of way, uh, whether if you've done like vascular research or some other endovascular type of research, that's helpful. Uh, and four, it's formalizing your findings and your work. So um, this will elevate your extracurricular work that you've done. So for example, the MSC has been working on increasing its publications. Uh, all we had to do was take our work that we had already done in the MSC and type up a short abstract with our findings and results, and we submitted to a conference. Uh, if the work was substantial enough or the findings were substantial enough, you could then convert that abstract to a manuscript and thereby elevating that extracurricular, you know, that um, experience that you have. So that's why I kind of liked it. Um, in terms of choosing a research mentor, I would choose a research mentor that devotes a lot of time to research and is already well published, if you can, if you have that opportunity. Uh, usually these individuals have a streamlined workflow for taking an idea all the way to publication and um, some other specialties are really good at this like neuro <laughs> they just like you know they just pump out research like uh, neurosurgery uh, IR is not quite there yet at least not at <laughs> a lot of institutes but we're getting there we're getting better so um, if you can find somebody who's like that that'd be really helpful um, but you don't need it like for me we didn't necessarily have like a uh, you know, a huge, huge research department or anything, but um, I kind of helped steer and uh, take that leadership position within uh, the projects that I kind of worked on. So you can grow in that in that kind of role too. Um, and let's see, do you think uh, it's important for students to attend and present at conferences? Yeah, definitely go to conferences. They're a great time, and you'll learn a lot from your mentors uh, at those events. It's a really good opportunity. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I, I like the point about how, um, you know, you really took leadership and, um, you know, led those initiatives yourself. Um, I think that's really important um, to kind of, you know, take ownership of, you know, the projects that you're involved with. Um, all right, Amy, would you like to talk about um, some experience you had? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yes, I was absolutely involved in research. Um, did a lot of time doing research. Uh, so, I, I did a project that was actually a pretty straightforward procedure. Um, it's called the sphenopalatine ganglion block and uh, a lot of insurance companies didn't cover it. And my research mentor was like, 
hey, let's look at safety and efficacy. And I was like, yeah, that sounds great. So um, I actually was able to get an RSNA research grant from that, um, from that project presented at my medical school symposium, uh, grad school symposium, um, SIR in 2019. So like you can take a singular project and as long as you're like updating it and have new data to present, just run with it. Um, and I also worked on a, a project that was kind of looking at like CLAB-C rates or uh, central line associated bloodstream infection rates. And that project, as well as some aspects of that sphenopalatine ganglia block project were really important because they kind of taught me when it's okay to say, this is fine, like we've done enough, we can cut this project. And that was something that I was able to talk about in interviews and just be like, you know, I've, I've been there where it's it actually just makes more sense to like not fall for that sunken cost fallacy. Um, so research was absolutely helpful for my application, um, especially in light of kind of my blah step scores. Um, I don't think, especially because IR is not something that a lot of people find until their third or even fourth year, um, I think we are getting better at advertising it, but because a lot of people don't find it late, I don't think many programs are going to be like, oh, your research was in cardiology. You know, they're, they're still going to admire the fact that you were able to publish something or, you know, just participate in a project and then you understand how empiric science works. And that you know you can take an idea from start to finish and be able to complete it um and kind of to ryan's point too like and also in answering the question about like how to find a research mentor um absolutely i agree try to find somebody who's published before somebody who seems to enjoy mentoring students um deepak i went to the sir site and pulled up the link um, if you can share that to the rest of the chat, but this is just like, here are some med student research opportunities um, from SIR, but if you have IR at your institution and you can like reach out to an attending, um, but do know that no matter how motivated your attending is, exactly what Ryan was saying, like you, you kind of need to be the one who makes sure that your own projects are getting finished because I have had, after graduating, um, I've had a number of projects that I was working on and I just kind of like, eh and those have kind of fallen through the cracks. So you, it really matters, like your own productivity is kind of a result of the amount of effort that you're able to put into it. And if you have a mentor that's like not responding to email, just like email them again, it's fine. Like they're, they're your mentor, like they agreed to this. Um, and as to the point about uh, going to presenting at conferences, I think it will only help your application if you don't have that experience, like if you don't have a presentation. Um, I don't think that would necessarily hurt, but yeah, you should totally go to conferences. You can like geek out with your friends and you can learn about new equipment. And there's normally people who are there who are like, oh, you want to play with this? And you're like, yeah, this is cool. So yeah, absolutely. If, if you have the resources and time, um, there are tons of local symposia, um, obviously national conferences if you can make it, but um, I know the timing is really difficult and money is also an issue. So that's, that's that. Great. Thank you so much, Ryan and Amy. Um, I think those are all really great, great points. Um, and for all the um, attendees today, I just put um, Amy's link in the chat um, about research opportunities. And we actually have two questions um, that are relevant to research that I think would now would be a good time to ask. Um, so do I, um, Raj asks, do any of the panelists today have any experience or know anything about taking research year in medical school um, or a year off um, to do research or get a master's in fields related to IR? Um, and then anyone feel free to jump in um, with your thoughts. I, so I, I personally don't know anyone who's done that. Um, I think maybe like I know that like Durham will do that. I I'm sorry, I'm not really informed. I don't know if any of us are well informed enough to be able to address that. I I knew one guy that did it, and uh, he he had couples match with like a really competitive specialty, and they both did research years. I don't really think it's necessary. Like I'm I started I got into IR halfway through my third year, 
from a DO school, but it's like, there's like no IR research there. And I just like, you know, networked and found cases to present at like different conferences, like virtual conferences because of COVID. Did case, like published case reports, like some reviews, you know, submitted some abstracts to SIR and that was good enough, you know, just show like that you try. It doesn't have to be like super high quality research. If you get started early, definitely do it. Like what, what they were saying, like that's the way to go. But if you're later on the ball, like I am, you can go my route as well. Just doesn't have to be necessarily IR related research, but if you can get it, it's really impressive. Um, but there's different ways of going about it. I don't really think you need an I, like an IR research year, but if you really want to stand out and go to like the top program, then maybe like if you're going for that kind of thing, then maybe then IR research year could set you apart. Um, there are very few uh, opportunities. I could connect you to the person that did it if you are really serious about it and he can probably like lead you in the right direction. Great. Thank you um, so much, Tony, um, for sharing. Um, all right, great. We'll move on to our next topic now. Um, extracurriculars. Um, so what extracurriculars were you involved with? Um, and do you feel like they benefited your application? And um, all the panelists today, um, in some shape or form, were involved with um, the SIR Medical Student Council. Um, so if you could take some time to talk about the role that the MSC played um, in your time in medical school um, and any advice you have for those interested in getting involved with the IR community. Um, and we'll start with Adelaide. Well, yes, extracurriculars, I think they're great. I think they're fun. It gives you a chance to exercise other muscles in your brain and uh, instead of just studying for medicine, et cetera, it, it's, it's fun. So I got into, I was a part of class council. I was treasurer and that helped me with uh, putting together events. And I felt like that uh, helped me with leadership skills, probably just basically. And then I was a part of an oncology student interest group and that got me more, well, so since I had done cancer research in the past, I felt like I needed to continue that uh, passion and I wanted to and it led me to going to ASCO which uh, going to an ASCO conference which got me exposed to a treatment of a liver tumor and that's what got me into IR and I felt like whoa if I had not been in, in this student interest group and I had not gone to this ASCO conference I wouldn't have like found this awesome field and I felt like that benefited my application because it led me into IR uh, with other groups like radiology interest group uh, that gave me uh, the opportunity to network with several sorts of students or attendings or residents. And, and um, it also gave me the, t uh, the opportunity to find mentors in the radiology interest group. I was also a part of our school's research group, our radiology research group. And that gave me um, more, uh, I guess, exposure to the different sorts of research that's going on, whether it be in pathology or uh, how radiologists help with public service and maybe even trying to increase diversity in the field. And I was a part of SNMA, which also uh, built my interest in trying to mentor students, whether they be high school students or undergrads, uh, just to encourage them to go and to follow their dreams, whether it be going into medicine or otherwise, but as long as they are doing what they can to follow their dreams. I was a part of and GLAM, which is our LGBTQ advocacy group, which gave me more exposure into trans health and how medicine is not really, um, there are some shortcomings in medicine and we're always trying to find ways to improve. Uh, I dove into that trans health and how in radiology we can do things to make, um, to make the atmosphere better for people of all uh, genders and identities. So, I found ways in each of my extracurriculars that uh, I found ways how each of those extracurriculars benefited me and encouraged me to go down this field wherever I'm going. So if it's IR, I, I would say when you're putting in your application, take some time to think about how each of these extracurriculars are uh, moving you down this pathway and how they're how they've um, hmm, how they've 
gave you character <laughs> in some sense. And then MSC, I got a chance to, I was a part of the MSC reserves and I got to put together an undergraduate or a symposium for undergraduate students, uh, linking some students from MIT and students at Howard, those who are interested in biomedicine and interested in um, uh, uh, product development. And uh, we talk, we just give them a little talk about IR and how they could bring those passions together if they continue this, continue down the field of medicine and eventually into IR. I wanted to get them early. And let's see, I would, any advice I would give to students that want to get involved? Yes, join SIR uh, or, you know, join some of these, these uh, national groups like SIR, ACR, RSNA. Uh, okay, maybe I shouldn't have said all of those. But, but look at Twitter, join, <laughs> You don't maybe have to get too involved with social media, but you know, sneak around, take a peek at what's going on in the current events, and you might find mentors there, or you might find friends there. Found a lot of people there. I, I, I still, I'm going to meet all of you one day in person, and I would also take the risk to uh, lead projects. At, at first, it could be a little intimidating to lead a project, but you know, just go for it. People are not going to let you fail. They're going to be there for you. So those are some tips I would give. And join, do extra careers, do them. <laughs> yeah. Great, thank you, Adelaide. Um, I think you know those everything you mentioned really, um, I'm sure allowed your um, program directors to you know really get to know you more than just a piece of paper, right? Um, so that's awesome. All right, and Amy, would you like to go next? Adley, you're so wholesome. Like every time you talk, my cheeks hurt because I'm just smiling. Um, <laughs> oh my God, wholesome we are together. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I was in a ton of extracurriculars. Um, I did totally put all of them into my URS application because try hard, but um, the ones that I really thought mattered to me, like that I wanted to be in and, you know, describe, um, I was able to have more of a leadership role. So like, um, my school's LGBT people in medicine group. Um, I helped plan a trans symposium. Like we started a group for uh, socialized medicine, essentially saying like, we can totally do this in this country and it doesn't have to be the status quo. Like I played a larger role in things that mattered more to me. Um, shoot, I started a women in radiology group <laughs> at my school. Um, so like, we already had a radiology interest group, but IR is only like 8% women. Um, and radiology is still pretty, it's, it's not quite 50-50 for diagnostic. Um, so yes, when you're kind of describing all of your extracurriculars, think about like, how did this actually impact you? Because no, not everyone's gonna ask you about like, oh, you were a step one tutor, huh? How was that? Did you like it? But you know, you can kind of build on those experiences and be like, okay, I was able to mentor students through a research project here, like I was able to create a detailed itinerary here. Um, all of those skills will come into play. Um, all of those things can be, uh, I don't want to say like twisted, but all of those things can kind of be like phrased in a way that helps to present you as a more complete little package. Um, so insofar as the SIR Medical Student Council, um, I joined SIR as part of my research project. And then I was like, oh, I want to be part of this council. And um, I actually put it into application uh, somewhat shortly after having surgery. And um, I was called and they were like, oh, you were accepted. You had some really cool ideas. And I was like, <laughs> what were those ideas? I can't remember. So during the education committee, um, started kind of a lower spot on the totem pole, just like editing presentations. Um, and then uh, after that first year, um, we got a new subcommittee chair and she was like, hey, uh, there's this project that like I've kind of been trying to build up and we're gonna make materials for kids. Uh, just, you know, you, you can run with it. Like I'm already president, so I kind of have my hands full, like, or sorry, I'm already chair, um, kind of have hands full, like, do you want to run with this? And I was like, yeah, of course. So she actually gave me the creativity to like decide, you know, what, what do we want this to be? This pediatric IR project, this IR for kiddos. Like, 
so I figured we probably already have enough pamphlets that like describe, you know, what what is this procedure doing? So I wanted to give materials to kids, for kids. So we had a ton of recruitment. Um, Sid Turkle for the, the chair of the reserves was really great at filtering people in. Ryan gave me a lot of support. Um, and just, we had a ton of people create these really, really cool, unique projects that are focused on the kids to like explain the procedure in a way that isn't scary, but is engaging and not that like surgery is fun, but you know, makes it more approachable, helps to open up that conversation about, um, you know, informed consent or assent in this case, and just kind of giving the kids a better idea as to what it's like. Um, so that, I, I really think that gave me a huge leg up in my interviews. Um, and I met a lot of really cool people. And like, some of my members were able to show off some really cool artistic talent, which is awesome because in med school, like your creativity gets smushed. So um, any advice that I would give to a student who wants to get involved in IR, um, uh, join SIR, <laughs> try to become part of the reserves, if not like on a formal council. Um, but otherwise, yeah, just like attending these events, get a Twitter, get a professional Twitter, and just like follow people. Because you'll, I, I mean, I'm assuming a lot of you guys are here because you saw the little like tweet, you know, you'll be able to network really easily. And I've actually been able to keep in contact with people who I interviewed with um, just because we like DM each other on Twitter. So um, SIR, Twitter, when conferences are a thing again, oh my gosh, please go. There's so much fun. Like if you run into me, say hi, I'll get you a coffee. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Amy. Um, and for all the attendees, um, I highly recommend checking out Amy's IR for Kato's project. It's awesome. Um, and finally, Ryan, um, if you want to you know, briefly touch on the MSC, um, I know <laughs> obviously you were quite involved in it, so we'd love to hear your perspective as well. Absolutely. And I, I'd echo a lot with what Amy said and Adelaide, especially um, with the extracurricular involvement, like just do things that you are passionate about and uh, don't be afraid to lead. Like that's, that's really good advice. Um, yeah, in terms of the MSC, uh, joining the MSC early on was a no brainer for me. Um, so my big thing is always like talking to the people above me, the students that came before me, the residents that came before me, always reach out because why like reinvent the wheel? You know, if you're going to make mistakes anyways. Why not just like at least learn from other people's? So, uh, they said, join the MSC. Uh, I submitted my application, joined. It was one of the best decisions, if not the best decision I, I did my medical training as far as like growing as a professional and uh, as a medical student uh, trainee, um, I think I underwent like a lot of growth through that process. Uh, and the IR community is very, very small, very small. I think we have like the smallest number of spots for any specialty, even less than plastics, um, for the integrated at least. So everybody knows everybody and uh, the SIR is like the society for it. So <laughs> it's a, there's no better way to join it, our level at least um, for IR. Um, so bullet points really fast. You'll meet amazing colleagues, like Amy was saying. You'll stay ahead of the curve on new procedures and research just by virtue of working on these projects, by networking with people on Twitter. Um, you'll meet current and future mentors through it. It gives you a platform to add value to the IR community. Like you'll actually be creating an impact on this like young and growing community. And lastly, it'll help you build your resume, not just for residency, but for future positions in the society if you choose to be a part of the society like uh, as a resident in the RFS or as an attending in the early career section. Um, and as far as uh, getting involved in the IR community, uh, join the MSC. If that doesn't work out, then uh, work with the medical student reserves. We have uh, the reserves, which is a sister group of the MSC, which works on those same exact projects. And then you can demonstrate your value through working with the reserves. Uh, alternatively, you can take the initiative of leading um, your VIR interest group at your local school, or if you don't have one, starting one. Uh, start an IR symposium and collaborate with neighboring institutions. Uh, guarantee there's so much opportunity to do stuff. Just go out and uh, do something, <laughs> something you're passionate about. And uh, yeah, don't be afraid to lead. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. And yeah, I um, didn't even know about IR until I went to the symposium my first year. Um, so um, there's definitely plenty of ways to get involved and learn more about the field um, through symposiums and um, interest groups and things like that. 
All right, thank you for sharing. I'll we'll move on to our next topic now. Um, so um, social media. So what role do you think social media played um, in your medical school and application process and um, any common social media pitfalls? I know Amy touched on it a little bit um, previously, but um, Tony and Adelaide, uh, if you'd like to give some of your thoughts about social media. All right, so I wouldn't say I'm the best person to ask about this. I became aware that people were using social media um, to, especially particularly Twitter, to, to network, especially during uh, COVID. Um, there's a huge IR presence on Twitter, really random, but that's just the way it is. Um, so I try to get into Twitter, but I'm not really good at it. But uh, other people were able to use it more effectively to like foster relationships with like different programs and program directors, and it helped them with the um, the interview trail like immensely. But for me, I was able to get into some like little research projects, like um, and different like IR initiatives. Like uh, I got involved with the the IR ethics um, committee and we submitted some abstracts and that was like a cool thing that I wouldn't have found without social media. And uh, really uh, I was able to figure out when different programs were having their open houses or if they're having any kind of meet and greet with residents. And it was mainly just to follow the programs and see what kind of material they were putting out and um, to see if I could like learn more about the programs and, and uh, Pitfalls, I'm gonna let someone else take that. Um, again, I wasn't like the best at social media, so uh, I'm sure there's other people here that can answer those questions. Yes, I don't know about the pitfalls. I mean, there are plenty of pitfalls probably. Um, like being negative, or something like that, that's probably a pitfall. Or um, maybe posting patient information. People don't like that, you shouldn't do that. Yeah. Oh, but um, hmm. what role does social? Are, Tony, are you done? Yeah. Okay. So, what role does social media play in your medical school? I felt like social media got me a chance to network with um, to network with a variety of people. I mean, at first, I started a couple of years ago, and I mean, at first, I was like, oh, I'll just get on here and let me just look around. I'll just um, follow a variety of people. Uh, who are in radiology. And then I'll follow some people who are in interventional radiology. And let me follow some groups and some national uh, professional groups and see what's going on with them. And then I started to look at individual programs that I thought that, well, maybe I'd wanna live in XYZ city. Let me look at what this program is doing. And just by being curious about various aspects about, about uh, radiology, like where you might end up, who these people are, what are they doing? You end up, or I ended up just um, following a lot of people. <laughs> and then I started to get the, the idea, well, maybe I'll just retweet somebody's information and uh, say, oh, this is cool. And then I'll start taking pictures of different things in conferences and try to repost that. And I don't know if that's a bad thing to do or a good thing, I don't know. But I was just, if I was excited about something, I would post it and say, oh, this is cool. And, good job, blah, blah, blah. And eventually it, got, it gets to a point where you have your own content that you would like to post. If you are if you are a leader in some sort of um, event or some sort of group, then you might end up posting original content for people to come to a variety of events. But I mean, you don't have to do all that stuff. I felt like social media allowed me to just find other aspects of radiology that I would not have otherwise, since especially my my home institution doesn't have a radiology uh, residency. So that kind of motivated me to look around at what other residency programs are doing. And I felt that Twitter helped and Instagram, they all, social media helped with exposing me to what to expect. And um, I think that it also helped with, um, and if you're interested in certain things like global health or women's health or uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, justice in various fields, uh, you can see how involved those programs or various programs are in each of those initiatives that you might be interested in pursuing in the future. So I, I felt like social media helped me with uh, deciding where I'd like to go.
and it helped me see what the field is like and how accepting people are in radiology. And everyone is super nice in radiology and really smart. It's it's the best place to be. All right. If I may say, oh yeah, okay, go jump, jump, jump. Especially because all of us had to interview virtually. I feel as though social media gave me a much better sense of what my program was going to be like by like following various program directors, seeing the kind of content they tweeted. Um, it helped me get a better sense without actually being there. So if you kind of like, not saying that you should stalk program directors, but if you kind of like keep an eye, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it, it may give you a better sense as to what the program is like if virtual interviews are still kind of like the predominating type of interview this cycle. Great, thank you. Um, I think you guys all made really awesome points about how you can use social media to engage and interact with all these programs. Um, yeah, so great. And um, it looks like Min um, just joined. Um, Min, would you like to just give a quick introduction um, if, if you're able to turn on your audio and video? Um, is my video working? Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, you'll see a web. I don't, I'm not sure if the video is working. I'm on my phone. Sorry for that. I'm late. Um, my name is Min. Uh, I am uh, from Boston University School of Medicine. Um, and I am, uh, I matched to the Brigham uh, IR. And it's uh, categorical, so I, I was on uh, I was on vascular surgery, so that's why I'm late. I'm so sorry. Great, thank you, Min. Um, all right, uh, actually, um, since we're on, since you just arrived, um, I'm just wondering if you could um, share your experience um, using social media and how it um, impacted you during medical school and during your applications. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with Atle and Amy said earlier that I caught. Um, I only joined Twitter sort of uh, June like of the application year after I went to like one of these panels that you guys had and the one of the panelists said I should just join Twitter just to see uh, the open houses and, and things like that. Um, I feel like it was helpful because uh, one of my interviewers like recognized me from Twitter. So I, I maybe something came out of it. Great, thank you for sharing. Um, all right, we'll move on to the next topic now. All right, um, so this is the last question um, about uh, just the pre-interview process or pre-application process. Um, does anyone have any last minute um, burning advice that they like to give um, to medical students before starting the application process? Um, if so, feel free to just jump in and chime in. Oh gosh, okay, just really quickly. Keep a log of the pivotal moments during third year that, uh, I don't know, that spoke to why you shouldn't be going into medicine and also spoke to why you should go into interventional or diagnostic radiology. So you can refer back to it while you're uh, going on the interview process. Yeah, that's a great point, um, Adelaide. Thank you for sharing. Um, anyone else? I would say, um, so like before going into the application process, I would start thinking about like what kind of themes like they is going to, are you going to try to reflect in your application? You're going to have like a theme that you're going to take with you to every interview and like your personal statement and like, like kind of like the story that like instilled the values that, you know, would make you a really good IR, like kind of linking together your life experiences to IR. And it's like, it's not easy for you to link those things together right away. Like on a surface level, you don't really like think, you think like, oh, IR is really cool, but like, why do you think it's so cool? And you kind of want to discover that about yourself and make you a much more effective interviewer. And you can pretty much tackle any question they, they throw at you. Also, I was the kind of guy who would like obsess over certain programs. So I like the idea of certain programs. Um, in terms of like geography or what I've heard about them. But I would say keep an open mind when you go into the application cycle um, and say you're gunning for a program. Also know that, you know, 
every single year the program is going to be looking for something different and just because you think you're a really good applicant you don't know what that program's looking for that particular year so just keep an open mind and you know i found musc and that it, which is an amazing program and i never really knew about it before the application cycle that much and then i interviewed there and i got along with the people really well even though i had intended on like emphasizing putting my emphasis on other programs so i would just say like you know spread your wings you know try to use social media to learn about these programs go to open houses and you know just enjoy the ride as much as you can okay great thank you tony for sharing um now move on to the application um process so um correct me if i'm wrong but um, for all the MS4s um, on the call. But um, given pandemic restrictions, I believe um, MS4s are only allowed to do one away rotation this year. Um, I know the panelists, you know, you guys were also very limited um, in terms of your ability to do these types of rotations. Um, so what advice do you have for current MS4s um, who are looking to get a feel for programs um, with these limitations? Um, Amy, if you'd like to start. Yeah, I I didn't get to do in a way, which like MCW has a phenomenal VIR program. Like if you can do in a way, MCW is not a bad place to go. Um, I honestly, I think I already shared it in saying that, you know, try to use social media to get a feel for what the program is like. Um, if you can't actually rotate there, um, they'll often share, the PDs will like, you know, share little jokes or whatever sometimes or they'll talk about a particular case that they did that was really cool um so that's yeah sorry i don't really have much better than that at least it was a short answer <laughs> thanks amy um and tony if you'd like to go i know you also touched upon this a little bit um previously um unfortunately it's it's gonna really come down to uh you know talking to residents at the program um you know it's uh hard to get a feel for a program without actually being there and sometimes like on the interview trail you, especially if the interviews end up being virtual it, it starts to sound really repetitive so it's like those interactions you have with the residents are really important in my opinion um that can give you a real feel for the program um but you can really tell like like social cues, cues, you can kind of tell if like the residents are happy and if the residents are happy, you'll probably end up being happy too. Um, but it's, it's, it is really tricky and, you know, you want to just make the most of that one rotation and um, you can kind of take that experience at that rotation and you can com com kind of compare other programs to what you experience on that rotation and just try to make the most of it. It's, it's tough only being able to do one rotation. Yeah, Great. and yeah, it is tough. Oh, sorry. Oh my God, sorry. Oh no, you're good. You're good, Adelaide. Um, yeah, I think those are all great points. And um, just to clarify earlier, um, the rule is one or way rotation per specialty. So, um, IR and DR are you know considered two different specialties. So, um, you know that's one way if you want to um, get to learn a little bit more about programs um, from Simone. Thank you, Simone. Um, all right, Adelaide, um, continue. Oh, that's a good point. I didn't know that. Um, so yeah, uh, as others have mentioned, social media, YouTube, uh, you can find out more about different programs there. Um, I would even look into cold emailing or cold calling the program coordinator, the program director or residents, one of them, chief residents at least, someone's going to get back to you. Uh, you can look at the websites. I, I know I cold called a few places and they were really nice. I, I mean, it's I'm, I was surprised every time, but I realized I shouldn't be surprised because everyone in radiology was awesome. And um, then there are also those spreadsheets out there floating around, and you can probably get another perspective of what the programs are like from those spreadsheets on Reddit. Uh, look at the comments, and if let's see, it's just it's going to take some extra effort. That's just what we're going to have to do this time. Uh, maybe even asking some of your mentors from your home institution connections with some of the programs 
that you're interested in or with whatever programs that they are connected to ask them if they have anyone that they know there and see if you can find out more about the program great thank you guys um all of that was really good advice on how to you know kind of work around all these logistics um so now I'll move on to the next topic um success on radiology rotations um so you know what you found most helpful in preparing for these clerkships um specifically diagnostic and ir um any advice you have for making the most of these clerkships um and any specific recommendations for students hoping to you know get a letter um, during these clerkships um ryan if you'd like to go first uh in terms of most helpful uh for my ir clerkships uh, for me personally, I like going in with some confidence. Um, so like learning the basic language and procedures prior to starting. Um, we have a whole section on the website, rfs.sirweb.org, uh, which is dedicated to IR rotations. Uh, the whole uh, program we have on the website, it's called the Away Rotation Survival Guide, and it applies to home rotations as well. Um, this guide was created uh, for multiple institutions. So if you're doing an away rotation, actually, like, uh, let's say at Brigham, we might have one for Brigham um, on the website, and they're center-specific. Uh, but in addition to that, it's a collaboration with stepwards.com, which is a pretty, like, exhaustive, like, kind of foundation for IR uh, procedures uh, language. It also has some sections on diagnostic kind of techniques if you're interested in getting into that. But I'd say the expectations for DR are pretty low. Uh, it's like very uh, nice that it's like that. I think they just, at least our program, they just try to give us a, kind of an idea of what life as a DR is like, and it might be similar at your institution. Um, so in terms of the Aware Rotation Survival Guide, if you're really serious about it, you can get through the whole thing in two days. Um, other high yield resources on our website are the procedure guides. Uh, otherwise, just browse the website, our YouTube channel, and the Twitter feed for subjects you're interested in. Just kind of immerse yourself in it for a little bit and You'll naturally learn a lot about the field, just about things you kind of like to click on. Um, and then during the rotation, uh, as far as how do you make the most of it, uh, you can refer to the IR handbook uh, or uh, IR playbook for information on the given procedure. Use it as a kind of a reference guide. If you want to read in advance the day prior, that's always good. I use the procedure guides in those, those books. Um, speak with your seniors and other students who came before you on that rotation for advice. Um, IR departments can operate differently between institutions, so that's why I, the survival guide's kind of set up that way. Uh, and in terms of letters of recommendation, so for LORs, you wanna ask early and you wanna ask for faculty who know you best and who you get along with pretty well. Uh, it helps if they're involved with the SIR or uh, their senior faculty members are very invested in research, um, but it's not necessary. Um, and one last thing, uh, on the IR rotation itself, whether it's in a way or at your home, try to do like a case report or something, get involved in that kind of stuff if you can. Uh, it does help. It shows you have uh, initiative, you know, first one in, last one out mentality. Um, you know, it's it's a great time. Uh, some are known to be harder than other rotations, but uh, uh, most of them are, I'd say, like relatively, you know, it was better than surgery for me. <laughs> I'll say that. Great. Um, thank you, Ryan. And um, I'm going to be sending the link in the chat for the survival guide. Um, as well as um, the success for as an IR sub I um, panel, which actually happened um, about two weeks ago um, with hosted by Varun and Simone, um, which will have a bunch of great pearls in there, too. Um, all right, Tony, would you like to you know speak a little bit on your experience as well? All right. So these clerkships, especially if you do that in a way like in a way rotation, um, this is really your time to shine for anyone. At like a DO school or an MD school that like the IR resources at your home institution. Like this is where you, like he said, you want to ask early. The reason why you want to ask early is because they're going to pay more attention to you. Like the PD will pay more attention to you throughout the rotation, especially if you have other students there with you on the rotation. He'll know, oh, this guy asked me for a letter. He'll start like conversing with you in the NGO suite. And like little things like that can actually go a long way um in terms of like like he said try to do some research when you're there i actually would email the program before my like maybe two one to two months before i would go to that clerkship i'd email them and say i'm really excited to go 
and I intend on, I would like to do some research if there's anything available. And they actually would set me up with something to do while I was there, even though it wasn't like a project that was taken to completion, but I contributed to the project and I can put that on my ERAS and I could talk about it, you know? So that was really helpful. Um, the most helpful thing though, is like, just be willing to learn, use those guides that he was talking about uh, for DR. Um, you know, I would bring a little notebook with me and I'd write down things that I learned just to be more interactive because it can become very passive. You just watching someone read, you want to seem interested. So write down anything you learn. And a big thing that you can, like the best thing you can do as a med student and DR is just like know the common fractures. So I actually downloaded this free app called Sublux. I don't know if I could, yeah, you see that Sublux? has all the fractures on there, common mechanisms like management. And uh, if you could, you could impress your preceptor if you just know like common fractures, to be honest with you. But that and there's like, uh, there's modules. It's like the UVA radiology modules that are always recommended on clerkships, like just going over chest radio radiography, just like really basic stuff. No one really expects you to know much, whether it's IR or DR. Uh, that was my experience but if you're willing to learn and you're interested you're solid great um that was awesome advice tony thank you for sharing i'm definitely going to download sublux now <laughs> um and min um finally if you have any thoughts on um, how to do well on your radiology rotations yeah uh, i think uh, just to add for dr i think i was told it's helpful sometimes to so, uh, look at something up about the patient, especially if the the consult to radiology is kind of confusing. Just while, because um, radiology often use like a different program than the electronic medical records, and sometimes if the medical student could help the residents sort of like understand the the clinical picture, uh, sometimes that sort of drives how they look at a picture. Um, and then for IR, I, I think. Um, yeah, I definitely also use the resource from SR before, but I think um, sort of like when you're on the rotation, um, if it's possible to look at um, a similar procedure that that attending did if you're assigned the case, because they often sort of write what they did in the their notes. And so it's like exactly line by line so that you, you sort of understand sort of like what uh, equipment they're using, what catheter. And so and then you try to find it when you go onto the case and i think it makes it sort of a little bit more fun sort of like a, a game um and then like you can even ask them uh sort of why they use this kind of catheter and i i, I always think they kind of like that i don't know but those are my only other tips to add to what everyone else said great that was that was awesome advice thank you for sharing then um so great so now we'll move on to our next topic um, which is letters of recommendation. Um, so specifically, um, you know, roughly how many letters you submitted, um, whether they were from um, IR attendings, diagnostic attendings, um, surgery attendings, medicine attendings, or others, um, how you got to know these writers, and what um, your most important piece of advice um, you have for when obtaining these letters. Um, and Adelaide, if you'd like to start. Hi, yes. Okay, so letter, I had six letter writers, uh, one from, so I, I mean, at first I was going to do four, but it just kept snowballing. But uh, I got, because I didn't know if they were going to give it to me in time. I asked one from surgery, and I asked one from a pediatrics uh, attending. I got one from the diagnostic, the chair of our diagnostic radiology program, one who was a former chair. So he was my mentor for research. So it was like a research letter. <laughs> and then there was an IR letter. And, and then I got another DR letter from my away rotation. So for my peds and surgery, they just put radiology in the letter of recommendation. And then my diagnostic and interventional radiology writers decided to, or uh, they, we talked about it and we figured, okay, we'd write two separate ones, or they'd, they'd just switch out diagnostic and interventional uh, radiology. So they ended up writing me two each. But that was really, that was like last minute, Ugh, gosh. So we'll probably talk about that early on. 
so that you have that straightened out beforehand. Um, how did these writers get to know you? Some of them, they're in different ways. One of the, a couple of the writers decided to take a couple hours, a couple meetings to just like sit down and talk to me about my life and what my aspirations were. And this was during third year or toward the end of third year. And others, I would just meet on my rotations and would have little chats here and there with them in between rounds and such uh, or in between presentations. And that's how they got to know me. Uh, and let's see what other things and uh, what's the most important piece of advice uh, as as Ryan and Tony everyone's been saying get and start early because people at that point will start to look at you as they were saying and they'll say okay well if he wants a letter I'm going to take some attention I'm going to pay some attention to this person and they'll they will hopefully write something so I also make sure to ask if they Feel like they can write a strong letter for you or if they will write a strong letter for you because we'll write a letter yeah there are people who will write a letter and but you just want to make sure it's going to be strong because that's uh that's going to help with the interview process so we read those those letters of recommendations and it, it sways heavily or from what i hear it depends on the program probably but I think it does matter because they, they brought it up during the interviews. They're like, this person really wrote something about you. I was like, oh, wow, okay. I don't know what they wrote, but I believe in it. And some letter writers provide you the opportunity to look over their letter. So, I mean, if you have that opportunity, go for it. And, um, and, and uh, hopefully it works out. So those are some of the things that I would say. Be quick. Great. Thank you, Adelaide. Um, Amy, um, would you like to go next? Yeah, um, so I oof, I think I had like five. I did CT surgery, IR research mentor, IR um, just guy who I worked with who I loved, um, uh, DR, yeah, and then I asked a family medicine um, preceptor who was just like this very, very kind person who was trying to get me to do family medicine. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, they were they were kind of all over the place. And really the, the biggest thing is just, you know, like Adley said, if they cannot in good faith to your face tell you, I will write you a good letter, you don't want a letter from that person. Um, if they tend to use a template, maybe consider asking someone else. Um, so these letter writers got to know me personally because I worked with them. Um, really, the, the person who knew me the longest was probably Dr. White because I worked with her on research for, you know, three years at that point. Um, so I will say the most important piece of advice, and I like, I wish I had picked this up at any point. Um, definitely ask early. Don't ask when it's like, our ERAS applications were due in September. Don't ask people in August, like <laughs> not a good idea. Um, one of the IRs who was kind enough to write a letter for me did so with like, I was like, hey, uh, this is due in like two weeks. Can you do this for me? And he was like, oh, for sure. And he actually had to like, he had other things that he was working on. So be considerate of their time too, even if you're like a completely disorganized lump like I can be um, in your personal life at least. Uh, so that I think that's the biggest piece of advice. But I, just to echo what Adley said as well, um, multiple interviews, I was told you have some really strong letters of recommendation. These people must have really liked you. Um, so they, they will absolutely carry weight. Um, so good luck. It's it's kind of hard to choose, but good luck. Yeah, letters were something that I did lose a lot of sleep on because I just like, especially during COVID, it was hard to get the ones that I wanted or I thought that I needed. Um, I had two IR letters, a DR letter, and an interventional cardiology letter that I used for both IR and DR. And the most important thing was that they were strong letters. They didn't really care. I mean, if you have one IR letter and one DR letter and you've got another one from like family medicine and OB, they don't really care 
as long as the letters are strong and they're personal because they really like that's how they really know it's like if you're like they'll get to know you in a way through the letters and that's why they hold so much weight uh, if someone can really speak to your values and your qualities um then they can you know it, it goes a long way if someone's willing to like put their name on the line for you um so that was something that was brought up in all my interviews like oh you had such strong letters you had such strong letters and it was from people that i didn't even expect to write me really strong letters but um that was something that when people ask me like what do you think are like one of the most important things for your application it's it's actually the letters even though it's something that's very subjective it's actually very important um and the most important piece of advice like i said um ask early in the rotation um and i agree with amy don't ask late i did ask late and i got lucky and my last letter was in like three or four days before uh, like eras was uh, available to the programs don't recommend that but um you know you can always resort to that if you like feel like you're on a way rotation and you're doing really well and you want a letter from that rotation that's pretty much what happened with me um but yeah ask early and and another thing is and this is how you can utilize people who like alumni from your own school but an easy way to go about it is just finding out like talking to people who matched ir or dr from your program and ask them okay who wrote you letters and which people write the good letters and you can just make sure to go rotate and spend more time with those specific people and you'll know that those people like to write and they write good letters and if you can impress those people you're guaranteed a good letter and that was like how i went about like one or two of my letters so that's like a reliable way of just like utilizing the alumni at your uh from your med school great um thank you all for you know the great advice in terms of getting um letters of rec um one question that we got um that's you know pretty relevant um is what letters would you recommend if your school doesn't have access to an ir or dr rotation I'm going to say surgery. Um, if you're interested in IR, IR is minimally invasive surgery. If you're interested in DR, uh, you got to know anatomy. Um, and then also, if your school doesn't have IR or DR, um, please consider in a way if, if that's at all possible. Um, and then you can try to get a letter from uh, your OB rotation. Great. Thanks, Amy. Um, and now we'll move on to our next topic. Um, which is the personal statement. Um, so knowing what you know now, what is the most important piece of advice you would give regarding the personal statement? And um, do you recommend, or what are just your general thoughts on writing distinct personal statements for um, IR, DR integrated programs versus DR programs? Um, and Min, if you'd like to get us started with that. Yeah, sure. I, well, actually, I only wrote one letter for all programs, IR or DR or surgery prelim or transitional year, I never changed the letter. Um, I, I was like pretty specific that I wanted to do IR because sometimes when you apply to IR and DR, people get confused if you're like, if you actually just want IR. Um, and so that's what I did. I, I guess it worked out fine. <laughs> Oh, um, and then the personal statement. Um, so I, ju I just, I don't know if I made it unique or, or not. I just wrote like a very straightforward personal statement, how I chose IR, a one page, um, and then you sort of always include like um, what your goals would be um, or like what, what interests you uh, in general, because people sort of like, where you come from and where you want to go, uh, gives them a picture. Um, but I, I thought that I, I didn't spend so much time my personal statement. I sort of just wrote a super straightforward one. Great, thank you, um, and for that advice. Um, Ryan, would you like to go next? Um, so I'm someone who's not naturally a great writer. Um, my sister helped me with editing. But uh, the best advice I received was uh, to write about elements of your personality 
not showcased in your transcript or your CV or any other written part of your application, because um, that's really what's going to stand out, especially before they give interviews. Uh, so the so I, I was like again not a super talented writer at baseline. Um, the structure that was suggested by my school and colleagues to me, which worked really well for me, was paragraph one. Uh, give a personal anecdote about a moment or experience from your life. Non-medical might be preferable because it can sound more captivating or it's more personal typically, but it can also be medical. Uh, paragraph two is how that experience shaped or conveys your personality. Give one or two personality traits that are kind of specific and unique to you that you think that are pretty real to you. Uh, paragraph three, how that personality trait relates to your specialty of choice. So uh, I did do two separate ones, IR or DR, and I customized it that third paragraph for DR. Um, paragraph four, the last paragraph, uh, give a closing statement, a couple of sentences, followed by what uh, you are looking for in an IR or DR program. Um, and the reason I did uh, the second, the DR personal statement, I don't know if it mattered too much. Again, I think there's some crosstalk between, uh, it, at some programs there's definitely some crosstalk between IR and DR because they do coordinate the interview at the same time. Um, but uh, at some programs, they do want to see a commitment to DR specifically, especially nowadays as IR has its own integrated specialty, right? Uh, they don't want to take, they don't want to have all those spots taken up by ESIR um, residents. Um, and typically, it's never an issue. I think it's because they really pull from that DR uh, uh, background. But again, it varies from institution to institution. And um, again, the personal statement for me, they look the same except for that paragraph three and paragraph four. I customized it for DR. Um, also, I know we're going to talk about surgery and prelim year later, but I did customize paragraph four for um, surgery, TY, or medicine year. Just like a couple sentences, like why exactly do you want to do this type of year? What are you looking to take out of it? Great. Thank you, Ryan. Um, and Adelaide, if you'd like to close this off with the personal statement. Oh, of course. Oh, great points, everybody. I and I love that structure, Ryan. Uh, mine was kind of similar. I felt like I feel like that's a good structure. Uh, I did switch out the. There's a few sentences where I switched out IR for DR, like little anecdotes that pushed me toward my interest in either DR or IR, and I uh, did switch out a few sentences for surgery and TY programs, but generally it's the same. And my structure, I, I decided to um, make sure that you tell a story, who you are, what your personality is, and, um, and how you could contribute to the program or to the field. It's kind of like whenever I would apply to jobs in the past. I did have distinct letters for my favorites, at least for like a few of my favorites. I did mention a couple of their program, their, um, their, any special programming they had or professional development stuff. Um, yeah, I let's see. Any other advice? I would start early. I would ask a couple of friends if they could be objective. They can try. But as long as you also find someone who is a fun writer, someone who knows how to story tell, and make sure that you show the hint on top. And don't lie. I think those are all some great points. Uh, because you need to you need to speak your truth when you're talking to these people during the interview. And why lie? Be yourself. And uh, and that's some points I can give. Great, excellent advice, um, Min, Ren, and Adelaide. Um, so now we'll move on to ERAS. Um, so just generally how you should determine how many programs to apply to, um, whether that's IR, DR, and prelim. Um, what factors were most important to you when deciding which programs to apply to? Um, and then a bonus tip for Tony, um, if you have any advice on how to navigate the couples match. Um, and Amy, we'll start with you. Oh boy, okay. Well, um, because my step scores were lower than average, I took a shotgun approach and I applied to, I think it was like 52 IR programs, 50 DR programs, and I don't know, like, 16 surgery. Um, I didn't bother with TY because those, anecdotally, I've heard that those tend to be more competitive. I have zero data to support that. So like that said, um, for me, 
some of the biggest factors were really, um, I guess really the, the biggest thing that helped me narrow stuff down was um, my husband is a second year medical student. He's at a Caribbean school. Like when he does his rotations, he's kind of tied to programs on the East Coast or California. And I was like, I'm from the Midwest. I will never be able to afford to live in California. Even if I'm making doctor money, it's still gonna like, I don't wanna walk into a grocery store and be like, oh my God, what is this bill? So, um, a lot of my applications were sent to schools on like Midwest, you know, my kind of home territory, some of the South, a lot of the East. And um, I did apply to a couple like reach schools um, in the Northwest, California, et cetera. Um, but it, it, it was it was pretty broad. Um, realistically, uh, the only programs on the East that I like didn't apply to, I went to their websites, um, looked at like what their specific requirements are. Um, Harvard, for example, said uh, we have a cutoff of 245 per step. And I was like, I guess I'm not going to Harvard. Um, Cornell really want, if I'm correct, I may be wrong. Cornell wanted to have a letter of recommendation from the um, program chair. And that was not one of the people who I asked for a letter from. So I was like, oh, okay. Um, it turns out a lot of programs are actually a lot more flexible with those requirements. Um, uh, University of Chicago, for example, had a cutoff of 230, I think it was like 240 for step one. And I was like, mm, close. So I emailed the PD and was like, um, if I submit an application, are, are you going to look at it? And they were like, yeah, well, that's fine. And I got an interview there. So like, even if you're looking at these different websites that these programs have all of this information on, if there's something that like you're really excited about that program, and you just are interested in it, it certainly won't hurt to send an email to the PD or program director or to the uh, coordinator to be like, hey, I'm really interested. I have a question about this. Um, so yeah, I, I guess that'll, that's my answer. Very long-winded, sorry, friends. Great, no, that was all really um, helpful advice, Amy. Thank you. Um, Min, um, anything else you'd like to add? Um, the, I think the number of application was based on um, what my mentor told me. Um, so I had like, a, a, you know, a small list of programs and then he was like, add more. Um, and then I was like, okay. Um, and then he's like, why didn't you add this program versus like, oh, I don't think you'll like this place at all. Um, so it, it was really nice to actually have someone like run over the list um, before you submit because as I found out that you should not add program after you submit it. Um, so uh, even though they say it's it's possible, it like looks bad. Um, so don't do that. Um, and of course, I think the the factors like uh, is also based on just uh, for me, it was important clinically uh, how good the program was, but of course also geography and if I would um, like enjoy living in this city. Um, I applied to 36 IR42 DR uh, and then surgery prelim and TY year. Um, uh, let's see, I think it was 106 uh, altogether. Um, and then later I found out that some of these program actually have linked, um, linked like surgery year um, or a linked TY or a linked medicine year um, and that it was like a sort of a, a waste to, uh, to apply to them um, but you won't know that so you sort of just apply to uh, the prelim or the TY that's associated with the, the TY pro I mean the IR program and and then they'll tell you later that, oh, this program is linked and then you just enter this specific code. But I don't think you'll be able to know that ahead of time. I still was very confused about all the linked programs. Great, thank you, Min. Um, and then finally, Tony, um, if you'd like to give us some advice about um, ERAS and um, specifically touch on your experience with the couples match. So couples match breaks all the rules you just heard from them uh, <laughs> in terms of how many applications to send out. And what you really got to focus on is uh, first you got to establish your geography, like, you know, how far out are you willing to to apply? So if you're going to go into couples match, you got to prioritize being together uh, versus, you know, 
over like getting this whatever specific geographic location you want. Um, I probably I applied to 40 IR programs and I think I applied to way too many DR programs. I just there's so much uncertainty surrounding the couples match, not couples, but the couples match, and like the virtual rotations, uh, virtual interviews, and um, not being able to go on as many away rotations. But um, big thing, uh, you want to find programs that have your significant other's uh, specialty and yours. Um, you know, so you want to prioritize those programs, and then you can start looking at programs nearby. I would recommend. 30 minutes or less in terms of distance apart. Otherwise, it's going to be really exhausting to travel between you all. Um, so we would make an Excel sheet early on, like several months ahead of time. And, you know, we would like track the nearby, like we'd go state by state, which programs had like, you know, DR and PEDS or IR and PEDS, DR, IR and PEDS. And like, we'd have an Excel to track all that. Um, just so we'd ease the process when we, when it came down to actually applying, we knew which places like we could, you know, be at the same institution. And once you actually get the interview, you advocate for the other person, you know, I get an interview, I'll reach out to the program coordinator and see if they could reach out to PEDS. And she got an interview, she'd reach out to the program coordinator and see if they can get me an interview. And we'd like contact them on both ends. And it's like a, and they're they're familiar with it. They understand it, so they'll, they'll help you out. And couples match actually can be advantageous if you're both like decently competitive applicants and can interview pretty well. Um, another thing that makes IR couples match a little bit more complicated is if you want to be with your significant other during intern year, because a lot of times, like you won't, it'll be advanced, I would say most of the time, or you can find like a few categorical programs. I think like maybe like Georgetown was categorical, maybe UVA was categorical, but um, some places have, are pseudo categorical as I call them. Like what uh, Min was saying about like the linked, the internal linkage to the surgery program where they reserve two spots for you. That's what happened with me at MUSC. I think Penn State was another one of those programs, but you don't find out till like after you get the interview or till that that there's that linkage is there. Or if you go to like the open house for that program, you'll find out that they have the linkage. You can ask about it. But that's like another thing. So for me, I was applying to IM, TY, and surgery because I would just take whatever I could get to be at the same program. So I couldn't really pick, but I'm now doing a surgery prelim that's tailored towards IR. So it's a lot of vascular surgery and IR during the surgery prelim. Um, that's what MUSC offers and different programs are coming up with different things. It's, it's easy to reserve surgery prelim spots for IR because it's usually like one to two spots and there's always so many surgery prelim spots. So it's like, I think it's becoming more common, um, but definitely there's more categorical IR than there is for DR, but definitely dual apply because you just never know with the couples match. It's definitely dual apply and look for the DR programs that have ESIR and in-house independent IR fellowship. Because a lot of times they'll reserve those spots for their ESIR residents. So if you really, really love IR, that's another way for you to go into it and not have to worry about applying to fellowships somewhere else later down the road. So you want to prioritize those DR programs that have ESIR and independent IR within the same program. Um, and if you want to talk to me more about couples match, because I could talk about it for like hours, um, I'll just leave my, I'll, I'll leave you guys with my email and you can email me whenever. Great. Thank you so much, um, Amy, Min, and Tony. Um, and Tony, just curious, um, how many combinations did um, you end up putting on your rank list for a couples match? We maxed out the 300. We even ranked yes. programs we would never want to go to, but it was because we we kind of went with the all or nothing approach. Like either we both match or we both didn't match, which is not really recommended, but like we just, we decided to go for it because we could match it. We, we were able to get enough interviews to max out the ranks. And I think it's like, you want to get like 21 each or something. I think that's what, that's like the threshold. 
and there's different like uh websites you can go on to that's like a couples match rank list generator it'll do it based off distance or based off average rank and you can like manipulate it in different ways super complicated um i get ptsd just looking at the rank list um so <laughs> it takes a lot of planning but it's definitely doable and you can pull it off great thank you so much um it seems like um, definitely an intense process, but I'm glad you were able to, you know, figure that out with your wife. Um, so now we'll move on to um, just talking a little bit more about prelim years. Um, I know some of you guys are doing categorical um, or pseudo categorical in um, prelim years. Um, some of you are doing, um, you know, medicine versus surgery versus transitional year. Um, so just um, was wondering if you guys could give some of your thoughts, um, Ryan, if you'd like to get us started. Uh, so for pre I would suggest uh, if you're shooting for TYs, apply broadly. And even for surgery, uh, I'd apply uh, broader than you think. So I only apply to like 10 uh, surgery, 10 TY. Probably should have done more, especially surgery. Um, but uh, if you do apply for surgery, uh, it was recommended to me by a lot of residents uh, who went through it to choose a community-based program where they give you a lot of OR time and autonomy generally. Contrast with uh, big academic centers where you do a little bit more, generally speaking, again, Scott work, um, you know, note taking, you don't get too much OR time. Some claim you do, like as a binary, yes, you do, but it's like more of a gradient. Like you may step into the OR once the whole year. So um, definitely like get a good impression of like how much OR time you get if you do opt for the surgery route. So uh, I did opt for a TY at the end of the day. And um, you will hear many programs encouraging applicants, many attendings encouraging applicants to take surgery prelim years. Um, I'd say surgery is recommended a little bit over like 50% of the time, but you know maybe other people's impressions are a little bit different. I'd like to hear what you guys have to think. Um, here are some of the reasons that I got for why surgery. Uh, you learn the abdominal and transplant anatomy very well in the OR, and that helps for your DR rotations and also knowing what you're getting into when you're under fluoro and you're, you know, stopping bleeds and everything. Uh, you'll develop basic surgical skills, which help a good amount. You'll think like a surgeon through pre-op and post-op assessments, and you'll learn about the importance of clinic. So uh, my reason for choosing a TY specifically uh, with many electives was to get a mix of surgery and medicine. Uh, it's perceived as a chiller year, but the way I'm structuring my year, it'll be a little bit harder than a typical TY, more like surgery uh, with the several, sur uh, several surgery months, about six surgery months. Um, uh, PD, I respect very much. Also put it very simply, <laughs> you don't need to suffer through 80 hour weeks for four months on colorectal surgery. It's just unnecessary for an IR. And, you know, it's up to you at the end of the day. Don't let anybody force you into something you don't want to do. But at the, at the end of the day, it's your training. And you want to think about what you want in your training as an IR. Do you want to be like heavy vascular, heavy surgery clinical, or do you want to be like a mix and, you know, you can make it happen, I think, either way. But, uh, yeah. Great. Thanks, Ila. If you'd like to um, chime in um, with your thoughts. Sure. Sure. Um, I applied to, okay, with prelims, I thought about two things, whether I was applying to the, radio, the radiology program at the institute or I was applying to a city that had close friends and family. So I was thinking about those two. Uh, uh, aspects when I was applying to prelims. I eventually, so silly, I only applied to like 16 surgery prelims and six TYs. I, I didn't, I would apply to, I forgot to apply to more later on after I, I, I was going to do this whole thing where I would wait until I got interviews and then I would apply to more, but I think I forgot to do that. And I was just, I don't know, excited to be getting interviews for IR and DR, but then I was like, where are my surgery and TYs? Where are they? <laughs> okay, but eventually they came in. It's just, um, yeah, I, I'd applied to more than what I did. Uh, with regards to surgery, yeah, people, I remember during the, during the whole uh, process, people talking about how it would be good to go into surgery, at least program directors were talking about that. And it'd give you some, as Ryan was talking about, all of those benefits like surgery, uh, anatomy, and um, just getting comfortable in that sense, being procedural and the work hours are similar to IR. 
And can I hear people talk about how medicine would be a benefit It'd give you this idea of how to uh, develop your clinical de decision making skills. But then I also heard that TY would be fun because you get exposed to a variety of electives and different perspectives of, um, of providers. So I happily ended up in a TY and it, it will be, I'll see how I haven't, I did receive my schedule, but I just don't know how difficult certain parts of it will be. But I know I will be exposed to a variety of areas and I'll be making sure to um, expose myself to the radiological aspects of each of those rotations. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's all I would like to say. That's okay. Yeah. Great, thanks. I was just Sorry, saying, and this is probably the last time before you dive into radiology and interventional radiology, whichever you end up in, that you'll have a chance to do those electives like pathology or ortho. Why am I going into orthopedic surgery? That's my first rotation. Oh my gosh. But it's going to be great. I'm exposed to all the different fractures. I'm going to download sublocks and figure it out. So great. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Adelaide. Um, and Amy, um, any thoughts? Yeah, um, so like I said, I didn't think my stat scores were good enough for a TY. I've got a very wriggly cat. Um, I uh, I wanted to do surgery because my experience on medicine was it's a lot of sitting around and, oh, there's the puppy. Um, <laughs> I was, it was a lot of sitting around and like talking about problems and not really like doing anything aside from like clicking buttons. And I just, if I'm going to be spending like hours and hours and hours at a hospital standing around, at least I want to like be you know, um, so that, that was, that was my personal preference. That's all. Um, I did want to do a categorical program because I only wanted to move once. So I got lucky and, uh, matched into a categorical program. So, yay. Awesome. Thank you for sharing everyone. Um, now move on to our next topic. Um, and, um, just thank you everyone for, um, who's continued to tune in. I know this is a little bit of a longer talk, but you know, all of our panelists have such great information um, to share. Um, for the interest of time though, um, we're just gonna stick with the first two speakers, um, but any of the other panelists, feel free um, to chime in um, if there's something you, you know, would really like to say. Um, so now we'll talk about post ERAS. Um, so typically how, how quickly do you tend to hear back about interviews and um, what are your thoughts are um, regarding communication um, after submitting your ERAS application and receiving an invite. Um, Tony, would you like, if you'd like to get us started. So it was, it was a weird cycle for us because um, we submitted and the programs couldn't see our applications until like late October. So I started getting interview invites like a week and a half or to two weeks after I started, uh, after, I, uh, after they could see my application. And the DR and IR one started rolling in around the same time, to be honest with you. Um, it was early, I would have to say, I actually, my first interview was November 4th, and they were able to see our applications October 21st. So they had a quick turnaround time this year. Um, I think this year they'll take more time to review the applications because uh, I think I talked to a current fourth year and I think they can view the application starting end of September. Um, communication with residency programs. Okay, I did reach out to programs I was really interested in and didn't hear back from. I mean, we were, we were communicating with programs left and right when you're in couples match, like constantly. I mean, interest letters or reaching out to program coordinators on both ends to get each other interviews and they work. If you can genuinely express interest in a program and you just email the program director and like maybe CC the program coordinator, if you're genuine and you know they think you'd be a good fit, like it'll just bring their attention to your application. They might have overlooked you. And I've gotten interviews through that. I would say it's a red flag if you do it too much. It's like you try to contact them too often. But if you just shoot your shot, like a really good shot once. You know, it might you might actually get a good interview from it. So, um, do not hesitate to reach out to programs that you've not heard back from and you're really interested in. But 
also uh there's like a reddit uh excel that you can follow to see if the program has even like released their interview invites yet so people will post like oh this is the day when the first wave came out these are the dates that they offered so if your program that you're interested in hasn't even released invites out you probably shouldn't reach out to them yet wait till they send out their first wave and if you haven't heard back after the first wave then i would send that uh, interest letter great um that's awesome advice tony um amy any other thoughts yeah um same thing as tony uh application sent out october 21st first interview was um 11 4. um i didn't really contact any additional programs because again I, I entered the cycle being like oh i kind of suck as an applicant so i was like well if these programs like me they'll reach out to me um what i did do instead of like post ers communication was in my personal statements for programs that i was really interested in um i tacked on like three lines to be like i really like this program because of these things that are on your website and i had a number of pds who were like yeah that was actually really helpful and i'm glad that you mentioned that um I guess this would be a good place to add. I'm trying to find a quick way. You can link your pager. So like I was on a surgical service when all of the interview invites were coming out. So I forwarded my emails from ERAS to my pager so that my pager would go off and I could be like, ooh, I have to scrub out. I have to schedule an interview. Um, so let me try to find that info and then I'll send it to you, Tupac, so you can just like, you know, get it into the chat. Awesome, thanks, Amy. Um, I didn't even know that was a thing. I think that'd be super helpful. Um, great. Um, so next, we'll move on to um, interview advice. Um, so just generally, what are some pieces of advice you would give to students um, about the process um, and just some common pitfalls that um, can cause applicants to leave a bad impression? Um, and Adelaide, we'll start with you. Awesome. OK, so I'm just going to do a little, a few pieces of advice. Uh, I would suggest going to the open houses and making sure you go to the, the resident total bonding event that they might have the night before or the week before. It depends on the program. I, I realize that sometimes it's not always going to be the night before the interview. So yeah, go to the open houses and they do remember you or uh, uh, at least if you asked any questions, sometimes I, I realize during interviews, like, oh, you were at the open house, even though I remember at the open house, they said, we're not going to remember you. But some people do, so uh, I would take that, uh, take the time to go do that. I would also, as I mentioned before, like keep a record of the anecdotes that made you feel like this, oh wow, I can be a doctor, I can do this, or I can be a radiologist, I can do this. Uh, I would suggest as well practicing your story when you, when they ask, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. You just, um, just practice it uh, in the mirror or with a friend have a two to three minute version, have an eight to 10 minute version, because sometimes people want to hear a quick version of who you are. Some people want to just hear you talk the entire time during the interview. So just uh, be flexible with when you tell your story. On the technical side, I would suggest um, not having too uh, active of a background. If you're into sports, maybe yeah, have a little flag of the Eagles or whoever your favorite band is and or sports team I, I i do sports i know sports i don't know sports and have make sure that there's lighting whether you're using sunlight just make sure the sun is not coming from behind you or the lighting source is not coming from behind you because it can um, block out what your facial expressions are it could block out your face and some other technical things uh make sure that your connection is quality i would just if you haven't heard of this person, Yasha Gupta, she has a wonderful series of videos and she has a lot of um, advice on, on how to set up your environment. Make sure you're comfortable and you're going and you feel happy being yourself. And that brings us to some of the pitfalls. Not being yourself is a big pitfall because these people want to know if they can work with you and you want to know if you can work with them the way how you are all the time instead of how you are during pretend interview time. Just uh, try to be yourself. And I think another pitfall would be lacking humility. Or uh, uh, so I, I've just seen, I've heard from some people about how obnoxious some people can be. Just try not to be that person. And 
Uh, lastly, I would try to take a breath because there might be te technical difficulties. Don't get frustrated with them because it, it, it's no one's, it's not our fault. It's not their fault. It's just, this might be bad. So try not to get frustrated and laugh them off. The, the program coordinators are going to be there for you during the interview. Okay, that's it. Great, thanks Adelaide um, and Ryan, if you'd like to um, add anything else. Okay. Sorry about or that. Um, oh, okay. uh, this, was a, this was a little bit of an issue last year uh, with people over interviewing, not necessarily over applying, because you should apply and you shouldn't, you shouldn't, it's not a place where you want to save money is applying. You want to apply a lot of programs, uh, whatever you think is a safe bet. But in terms of interviews, if you're a competitive applicant without any like unique circumstances like couples matching or IMG or anything, don't hoard interviews that you're not likely to go attend to that school. It's doing yourself a disservice, you're doing the program a disservice, and your colleagues. It leads to a less optimal match for everyone. Um, it's just not great. Uh, but yeah, so I just put that out there and it's kind of a thing that was like kind of important last year, which bit some people in the butt. Um, outside of that, for virtual interviews, a lot of things that Adley was saying, a good camera, good mic, ring light, uh, good internet connection, do a wired connection if you can, clean office or room. Some people did a plain wall, others did like a desk with books or pictures, something that conveyed their personality. Um, some common pitfalls would be not knowing anything about the program, do a little bit of research at least, maybe talk to a residence, go to the open house, something to that effect. Uh, or not showing interest in going there, like genuinely be interested if you're going to go to that program. Another uh, pitfall that I just thought of, um, I guess I didn't think about it earlier because it's just like it became a no-brainer, but it wasn't early on. It's like don't ask about moonlighting, time off, and that sort of stuff to attendings. You can ask about it in the open houses with the residents typically and like the pre-interview dinner if you're going in person if they have that. But um, yeah, don't uh, try to stay away from those like no-no questions that are make you know portray you as a little lazy or something they are important maybe at the end of the day for quality of life when you're comparing like head-to-head -head programs but yeah try to avoid those and find other means of getting that information i also wanted to jump in really 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 quickly um one of the most important things that i learned i think it was from gasha uh was in your eras application when you are filling out your interests use the entire space because that's what a lot of people want to get to know about you. Are you going to be a person that they can like talk to if you're sitting next to eight hours a day? Um, that's actually where I had a really meaningful experience with my PD. Um, put in stupid things that you do. I like to eat bread. I like watching stupid movies. That kind of, that's a section that a lot of interviewers will scroll to right away and be like, okay, who is this person actually? Um, obviously, like everyone else has been saying, don't lie. Don't be like, yeah, I'm like a professional skier. Like, don't, unless you are. Um, but that, that section is really a good way to like get your voice through and kind of show everybody like, this is who I am. This is what I'm about. This is what I like, aside from like all those, you know, other stuff that I've done. Great. Thank you so much, um, Amy, Ryan, and Adelaide. Um, so next we'll move on to, um, <laughs> some more interview advice. Um, so in terms of common questions, um, I just sent, um, Ryan sent me um, a couple of questions that I forwarded to the rest of the attendees. Um, so feel free to check on that, um, as well as some common questions that um, are important to ask at your interview. Um, and other panelists, if you um, have anything else you would like to add, um, definitely feel free to jump in. Um, but yeah, other, if not, um, we'll move on to um, the next topic. And panelists at any point, feel free to jump in with any additional questions. Uh, but in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next section. Um, so ranking advice. Um, so um, similar to our previous question, um, what are your thoughts on communication with residency programs between interview and submission of rank list? Um, some, what are some factors that you thought were most important when creating your own rank list? And if you have any advice for applicants regarding um, you know, the rank order of IR, DR integrated programs versus um, DR programs. Um, and Amy, we'll start with you. Okay, so um, I didn't send any love letters because I was paralyzed and honestly, I kept like flip-flopping my top three. 
Um, and I was having a really hard time because I wanted to go to an IR program that had a really, really good collaborative relationship with vascular uh, surgery so that I would actually be able to do vascular procedures. I wanted to go to um, a categorical program. I wanted to be in a place where my husband could also be. Um, but really the, the biggest thing that led to me ranking in the order that I did was kind of the gut feeling that I had about the program. Um, and if I felt as though I would be able to just fit, um, that's pretty much how I did it. Um, any advice for applicants in order of DR? I only, I only ranked IR programs. I was very, very fortunate to be able to do that with my top 20 slots. And I did prioritize categorical programs. Um, but yeah, I mean, the factors that went into my rank list were kind of the same factors that went into my application list too. Great, thank you, Amy. Um, Adela, um, anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, okay, so thoughts on communication. I would, I did ask a couple of people. I mean, they were the people I was paired up with um, before interviewing. So I did contact again after the interview if I if there was a question that I had that that wasn't answered by anybody, and I uh, but that was rare. I mean, it was probably like four times that I did that or five times, and hmm. Sometimes I would talk with program directors and what factors did I consider most important when ranking. I looked at geography. And then I also looked at if I would be happy there or if I would thrive there in that city or geographical location. Um, I, yeah, I've looked at YouTube videos about living in XYZ city. I was like, okay, so can I live here? Can, will people be happy with me here? <laughs> yeah, I, I had to take that into consideration. And uh, let's, and okay, lastly, any advice? Yes, I ranked, I ranked a mix of DR and IR programs, although they were mostly IR programs, uh, and then a few DR programs that were uh, that were in places that I would really be happy living in, and, or had the IR programs that I appreciated as well. I, I made sure that all of the DR programs I ranked had ESIR capabilities as well. Um, yeah, that's. I think that that should do it. And oh, right. oh, and I guess a little bit about, yeah. a little more about communication. I did communicate through social media as well. All right, that's it. I do that. Awesome, thank you so much, Adelaide. Um, and we'll move on to our next topic. Um, so just general post-match thoughts. Um, so what factors on your application do you think contributed most to programs offering you an interview? Um, and then what factors in your interview um, do you think contributed to the programs um, ranking you highly? Um, so kind of those two steps. Um, and then any other um, burning advice or final comments you have um, for medical students? And we'll start with Tony. Um, let's see, factors on my application that contributed most to programs offering me an interview. Um, I would say, you know, Strong board scores, commitment to IR. I think that's a big thing. You know, showing that you had involvement in SIR. You know, showing that I had. I think maybe like my strong letters. I think those are all things that contributed to me getting the interviews that I did. Um, and in terms of ranking me highly, you know. Like someone said earlier, I think it was Amy. Um, big thing is like, can they have like a conversation with you about like normal things? So like, they're gonna ask you. You're gonna talk about like your hobbies and interests for like seventy percent of the interview for most places. Um, even if it's IR, it's not. It was stereotypically the DR interview, but like IR is pretty much you have. A lot of similar people like a lot of the ir programs stemmed from the dr program so like the interview style is like very similar um so i would say you know being able to just 
have a good time with their interview or if they like say a joke laugh at it if it's like if it's genuinely laugh like funny you know you don't have to like be ex excessively hysterical or anything like that but like uh just just relax be normal crack a cu couple jokes you know have a regular conversation with someone and and especially if you can do that with the residents and even if the residents say that they have no say in whether or not you get ranked, if they can like you know contribute to your rank or whatever don't listen to them um they all contribute um they all have a say don't listen to that they're essentially saying that for you to be yourself around them <laughs> i think but uh in the end like you know people at programs have told me like yeah like we will say that we don't contribute to the rank list but they all do but if you can get along with the residents really well and your interviewers really well um that can go a long way even if you don't feel like your interview answers are the strongest um and be prepared to answer tell me about yourself because it was the first thing that every single program is going to ask you to say every single interviewer almost at the beginning of every interview and that's your two to three minute elevator pitch and that's when you sell yourself and that sets the tone for the rest of the interview if you can get down the tell me about yourself first it's going to be scripted but after a while it becomes more natural you know it's like the first couple interviews then you'll just crush it but that's definitely get that going in your mind before interview season get that answer down and i think you'll be solid Great. Um, awesome advice, Tony. Uh, Min, anything else you'd like to add? Um, yeah, I think my application, it was probably just the letters. I think IR is such a small world that, um, you know, the people are going to recognize people's names and like they know the people. So like uh, the word of mouth, I, I guess, or by letter or um, is very important. Um, for factors for my interview, um, I mean, going into my interview, I always have like at least uh, like 10 questions per interviewer um, that are different. And sometimes I like group it by like um, physicians or residents because uh, you know, as I earlier, there's only some questions you can ask residents and never to attendings. Um, and I don't know if it's my like artilleries of questions or I don't know I feel like I'm pretty plain Jane so I I, I honestly don't know how the matching work <laughs> okay great um thank you man and Amy um, anything else you'd like to add mm. Mm. I think some of the stuff on my application, like I listed the jobs that I had before medical school. Um, I, I got a lot of research publications before I got to medical school and I'd like slap those on there anyway. And I think that really helped to like bolster my numbers. Um, yeah, just put the activities that you were involved in that matter to you. Like just try to make it a representation of yourself on paper, which is hard and boring. Um, the personalized personal statements I think helped. Um, the interest section helped. And I guess I just like, I did really, I just felt really good about all the interactions that I had at the program where I ultimately matched. Like my PD opened my interview with a joke about something that was on my interest section. So like, like he clearly read the thing and I was in interviews where I was questioning whether or not someone read my application. So um, yeah, uh, burning advice or final comments. Ugh, good luck you guys, <laughs> this process sucks. <laughs> awesome, thank you. If I can um, add Tony Min, one quick yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, just to kind of calm some nerves. I know this is like super stressful. We were all here last year and then the residents before that they were all there and every one of these webinars they always mention this one thing if you want to get into ir it's going to happen one way or another and if you're really dedicated to it it's going to happen so i will say don't be discouraged from applying dr i would actually say that the dr trading pathway doing esir and going for a fellowship at another institution 
is technically like a better training pathway because you get you get a variety of different you know perspectives unless you're really sold on one area like I was like geographically and you don't want to move like those are good reasons just to do integrated and just be you're good you don't have to reapply all that stuff but if you're really motivated you know this is for you do DR too like absolutely apply uh, for that kind of thing like apply your DR applications and, and get those in and uh, like don't be don't save money on that like apply to a lot of places um, the other thing is like put the work in in advance and it'll pay off the interviews will become relative like very chill um, so the more you do right now like it's just going to be the interviews are actually like very nice very pleasant you get to meet a lot of people so um, yeah good luck everyone and please reach out if you have any questions Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and um, for the interest of time, um, unfortunately, I don't think we have time to take any more questions, but hopefully uh, many of your questions that you guys sent in were covered um, you know, throughout the whole match panel. Um, and if you need to, if you have any specific questions for any of our panelists, um, I've linked their Twitter um, onto um, the slide. So feel free to ask anyone um, any questions directly. Um, but I just want to give um, a huge th thank you to all the attendees um, for coming today. Um, I know it's been um, somewhat of a long webinar, but um, you know we went, got through a lot of really good information. Um, so I appreciate you um, sticking around. Um, I want to give a special um, thank you to Varun, um, who's the Medical Student Council Chair, for helping me um, get this set up, as well as um, Dr. Fleming and Biddle, um, who are residents um, and co-communication chairs on the RFS. Um, and finally, a huge um, thank you to all the um, incoming residents, um, Adelaide, Ryan, um, Amy, Min, and Tony. Um, you guys have been really awesome. I think we've all learned a lot tonight. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, um, and have a good night. Have a good one. Have a good night. Be well. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah.